University of Georgia in Tiffin, and I'd like to start by thanking all of you for coming out here today, and also thanks to Georgia Cotton Commission for their support of my research program, and of course the University of Georgia for their support as well. Um, what I'm going to do today, uh, even though I was not personally in charge of running the on-farm variety trials, um, I obtained the on-farm variety trial data this year from Philip Roberts, who got it from a former cotton specialist, and so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about that data, and then uh, talk about a project that I've been doing for, well, last year and this year, uh, dealing with cultivar response to nitrogen application, and within that I'm going to talk some about seed characteristics, seedling vigor, and yield response. And then the last topic, I have a couple of different experiments that I want to discuss with you talk with you a little bit about. Uh, the first is drought during flowering. When I say early flowering, drought imposed at early flowering, uh, basically from that early flowering to peak bloom period, and then uh, potential issues with over irrigation. So we're going to look at two different things. We're going to look at the yield penalties that we get from, from drought stress at certain times, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the issues that we can run into with uh, irrigating more than we need. So I'll start with some of the on-farm variety trial data. Um, this is just showing varieties across all locations and many of you know that there are locations throughout the state, uh, a number of different field sites, I think it was approximately, I think it was 25 different sites and if you look at variety performance across all locations I think we've got a little less than 200 pounds to the acre difference from the very top performing variety all the way down uh, to the, the lowest performer, I guess you could say, okay? And that's one way to look at the data. Uh, the other, of course, is that uh, you can look at the number of times or the percent at which this particular variety was above the trial average or when it was in the top three performing varieties. Um, but we really don't start to see separation in these varieties until we get right about here, okay? Now remember, this is across all locations, okay? This is across all locations. So it, it doesn't tell you the full story because of course a variety might perform differently in one yield environment than it does in another yield environment. And so this is the sort of the large data table giving us the average yield for each variety, or at least some of those varieties, <coughs> within each one of these different, uh, different locations, okay? And they're ranked by average yield at a given location. So <coughs> each yield environment ranges from a 519 pound to the acre uh, went yield all the way out to 1,600, a little bit over 1,600 pounds to the acre. So that's a pretty broad range of yield variability, okay? Now, as far as what's causing that yield variability, it could be any number of things. We're just treating each site as a unique yield environment, okay? Um, but if you look at this, we have different varieties that are placed in the very top, you can see that this variety right here, and I've, I've got some tables where you can see it a little, a little more up close. You can see that this variety placed in, the, especially once you move over to some of these higher yielding environments, it's at least in the, at the top in, in a number of different sites, okay? Uh, this is, the highlighted things just show the varieties that performed well, or at least in the, statistically, statistically equivalent to the highest yielding variety in that environment, okay? So you can see this here, it varies based on what yield environment you're in. But um, what our former specialist did was then break this down into yield environments above 1,200 pounds per acre and yield environments below 1,200 pounds per acre, okay? And if you look at this, you'll see that, okay, we have that variety. Again, you've seen it at the top of the list um, early on in this presentation. But if you'll look in just about every location except for a couple, it's at the top. It's, one, it's the top performing variety. Um, and we've got 85% of the time here, or 85% of locations above 
where yield is above 1,200 pounds to the acre, okay? Um, so you can see this, uh, and you can see the, all the way down to the, the variety that um, either doesn't place in the top, depending on yield location, or is, is in the top performing varieties the lowest percentage of the time. So again, this gives you just a general range. And so what does this show? It shows you in a high yield environment, here are the varieties that tend to perform the best or most consistently in the top. In the lower yield environments, and, and by low, again, it's just sort of this arbitrary cutoff, but it's below 1,200 pounds to the acre, okay? If we look at that, you see kind of a different story, that there are different varieties that are at the top of the list there, okay? There's different varieties at the top of the list. Um, there's this phytogen one we have uh, everybody should be pretty familiar with 1646. We've got, again, um, different varieties kind of take the lead there when you get into the low yield environment. So what that should tell you is that you've got varieties that perform really well in the high yield environment, but then they kind of take a hit when you move into the lower yield environments relative to other varieties. So what I did is I wanted to look at this data just a little bit differently. I wanted to plot yield versus yield environment for every variety and then just fit a line to that and just kind of look at the slope of those lines. Whenever you have a line that's a, a really steep line, it just means that that variety is more responsive to environment. In other words, the more, uh, you know, the better environment you give that variety, you know, the better it responds, okay? And so um, this is, it's sort of messy. I'm gonna break it down and just kind of take away some of these lines to make it a little bit clearer here. Um, but this just shows the trial average yield <laughs> and then this is the yield for a given variety in a particular environment. And I removed a bunch of the dots from the, from the graph um, just so that it wouldn't be too messy. But what you see here, again, we have this Dynagro variety at the top, and then it's got probably, well, it has the steepest slope of any of these, okay? It is the most responsive to environment, to yield environment, of any of these varieties. The one that is least responsive, and when I say least responsive, that sounds negative. It can also mean that it's the most stable, okay? That's another way to look at it, all right? Is that this one has the lowest slope, it's the most stable across all yield environments. And then what I wanted to do, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of them that just sort of overlay on top of one another. The performance is pretty similar across yield environments, okay? But if we just break this down, if we look at the, the, you know, the most responsive, in other words, the steepest slope versus the lowest slope, what situation do we have here? What are we, um, you know, what is it costing a grower if you think about it? And I'm, not that I'm going into any economics, but in terms of yield, uh, if someone picks a variety, picks an inappropriate variety for their yield environment, it can cost them money, okay? So that's why this variety trial data is important. It's not to say, all right, you know, everybody should plant this one variety. It's to give you information. Uh, okay, if I typically am in this particular, if I have this yield goal year in and year out, if I have a high yield goal and I manage for high yields, then I'm gonna want a variety that can take advantage of that. If I tend to be a little bit on the lower end of the spectrum, um, I may want a variety that's going to perform better in that lower yield environment, okay? In this situation, the least responsive one, or the most stable one, really there's not a lot of yield differences at the low yield environment in, but there's a 400 pound to the acre yield difference at the high end, all right? You know, 70 cents a pound, that's a lot of money. Not that I'm great at math or anything, but that's quite a bit of money, okay? So there's a, you know, it depends on what you want for your particular production scenario, okay? Um, I went ahead and I put in 1646 because I felt like it would have been sort of irresponsible not to put this one in here. There's a lot of discussion about this variety. And the other reason I wanted to put it in here is that it was one of the high, if you remember that table, it was one of the higher yielding varieties, even in the low yield environments. The yield difference here, I believe, is about 50 pounds to the acre. So it's not huge, right? But it's still, I think it works out to about, it costs the 
If you had a, a variety that performed poorly in those low yield environments, it would cost the grower about $30 to the acre. So again, it still matters, and I think it's important that they have access to this data based on their production scenario. And that's, I'm not gonna go into any great detail. I wasn't the one, again, managing these trials. Um, so as far as experimental details, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to really ask Philip or see what information he had from our former cotton specialist. But at that point, I'd like to kind of stop and again, noting that this was not necessarily my data set, um, I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may have about that topic. Yes. Great. Great. Yeah, so this, so I did not get that data from, yeah, that's the thing. I didn't get that data from it. Um, I have no doubt that that's being, I don't know if that data is available or is being processed, but I just focused on yield here because that's the only data that I had access to. All is right. that in the cotton handbook? Hmm. Um, I believe, so to? I think, check the, um, I don't want to say for sure because I hadn't checked this, but I believe it would be, um, let's see here. I would think it would be on the UGA Cotton website. That's typically where they'll put the variety trial data. So check, I would check there first. Um, and then Pastor Philip Robbins if it's not there, I guess. Um, but yeah, so that, that would be where I'd look. Because you can usually access this online. It looks like he's already got the table built and has, has posted this. All right. And it would have rainfall tied to the yield. That. Uh, that I don't know. I think typically we just treat it like a yield environment. So that's the other, that's the thing. Let's say you got some of these sites that are dry land, but they got plenty of rainfall during the season. Um, you know, that's, that's going to alter your yield. Um, we are, as you know, many different things can affect yield. Fertility, pest pressure, all kinds of things can affect yield. I'll be able to go to sleep. <laughs> uh, but a lot of different things can affect yield. We are, these are just managed according to a particular grower's management practices at that, at that site, okay? So yeah, there's a lot of information we, you wouldn't have necessarily, um, but we do have a pretty good weather network throughout the state that there should be some weather station nearby at least. Um, all right, I'll take, if you have one more question, I'll do my best to answer it, and then I want to go on to the next thing. Hey, now, on these trials, all these trials, look at your stuff. Are any of these uh, plant maps about variety, looking at where these yields, I how, yield, how yield these rides that yield different, and where, they, <coughs> yeah, where I, this yield is actually coming from? Exactly. I don't think that they are. As you, if you've got background in plant mapping, I don't know how many of you in here have it. It's pretty time consuming. Um, and when you have this number of varieties, Again, I, I'm not sure if they've done in this, but I would almost guarantee you that it hasn't been done uh, because that's, like I say, knowing, okay, this, this node and this position along the fruiting branch, you know, where is all this yield <coughs> coming from, right? Um, that's a pretty labor intensive thing. There's the same difference in yields this year versus, you know, we did a lot of plant mapping in South Georgia, mm -hmm. and some of these varieties are unbelievable the way they would compensate and where that yield's coming from. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and I mean, we've, we've seen that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of this and some of our projects that, that we've done uh, related to irrigation a little bit later on, but, but yeah, exactly. So, you know, that yield can be coming from different locations. And again, typically, if you have a really aggressively growing plant, it can have a lower fruit retention, but still, still hit some pretty high yields. So um, anyway, but I don't have that information. All right. All right, so what I'd like to do, again, I'm sure everyone's got questions about this. This, If you think about the, the things that, that a producer would want to know about, we always want to know what variety do we need to plant for our particular, particular environment, and then, of course, there's all the inputs that go along with it. And so what I want to do next is talk about this project looking at cultivar responses to nitrogen. And we know there's a lot of different things that govern how a cultivar responds to nitrogen availability, okay? Um, but we get this constant release of new varieties. Everybody knows that, you, you know, you don't get custom to one variety and stick with that one for, you know, 10 years. You've got this constant turnover of varieties where certain varieties outperform the last, the last set or maybe the one that was doing really well a couple of years ago. Uh, and the trick there is each variety comes with its own unique 
management requirements, okay? Most likely. But what we would like to do is just apply, if we could make some broad generalizations regarding management, if we could use some characteristic of that seed to govern some of our management practices, I think that would have tremendous potential in the future. And let me just kind of tell you what I'm, what I'm talking about here, and that is that there is an argument that if you have, I think you've all, I'm sure you've all heard this. Okay, well, we've got these higher yielding varieties, and we say that for every amount, every bale of cotton, we need to add a certain amount of nitrogen, okay? And so the argument goes something like this, that we've got these higher yielding varieties, but in order to reach those yields, we need to be putting on more nitrogen, okay? However, these higher yielding varieties over the years have been bred for smaller seed size. Where is most of the nitrogen in a cotton plant? Where is most of that nitrogen taken up? If you could break that plant down into leaves and stems and all these different plant parts and see where most of the nitrogen is taken up, it is, it is almost about 40%. But you think about how big that plant is, 40% of the total nitrogen is in that seed, okay? So it is a major sink for nitrogen. And so there is an argument that as we've selected for higher yields but smaller seed size, um, we may be able to get those higher yields and apply the exact same amount of nitrogen, or possibly even less, okay? Um, but things are somewhat complicated by the fact that larger seed tend to be more vigorous in the early growing season, okay? So if you've got a plant that's more vigorous and theoretically has a very well-developed root system, it can it could probably scavenge for nutrients a little bit better as well. So this is not, I don't think, as simple. I, I haven't presented all the background literature, but I'm just giving you a little bit of background behind this study, that if we could make some generalizations about seed characteristics and apply nitrogen specific to that, that situation, I think that would be ideal. If we could just say, this is the bag of seed we have here, the seed characteristics, uh, here's my yield goal, here's what I need to be applying. And then we wouldn't have to worry so much about you know revisiting nitrogen response every time a new set of varieties comes out. At least that's the logic for this study. So what I want to do is give you a little bit of background about what varieties we selected <laughs> uh, for this study. This was selected a couple years ago. Again, you know, as time moves on, you know, we're going to be we're going to have a whole new set of varieties uh, to work with. But a couple years ago, we looked at the all the different varieties that were being grown on the on-farm variety trials. All right, we pulled seed from each one of those bags and then characterized those seed. So we had ones that were, we had like 22 different ones. We looked at seed size or seed mass, I should say. And then we took those seed and sent them off and had oil and protein content assessed on them. A colleague of mine in Texas did the, did the analysis. And so again, if you had a large seeded cultivar, a lot of nitrogen per seed, you would think that that one would require more nitrogen to hit the same yield goal. Again, that's the logic behind this study. Um, so from all of these, we selected six. We selected some that were at the low end in terms of seed size and protein content, and some that were at the high end in terms of seed size, okay? <clears throat> and so the experimental layout, we've, we've had to do this in different fields <coughs> over the years. The, the layout's a little bit weird looking there just based on the dimensions of the field. Um, but we had uh, six different nitrogen rates. It's a shame we can't see everything on that, on that background there, but we had six different nitrogen rates or target nitrogen rates ranging from zero to 150 uh, pounds to the acre. And uh, those six cultivars that I just talked about, and we had four replicates, okay? <clears throat> Some of the measurements that were conducted, um, we had at 14 days, we had some stand count measurements, we had some plant growth measurements, maturity, there's a lot of different measurements, but what I want to do today is just focus on the, the things that I'll be talking about today, okay? Um, as I mentioned to you, seed size should affect early season vigor, so we, we looked at various measurements of vigor, uh, whether it was uh, height and nodes, leaf area development, dry weight per plant. We did this at three and five weeks after planting. Um, now remember, these got probably, and I didn't mention this, but they got about 25% of their total season long nitrogen up front, okay? And our measurements were done at that, our last set of early season measurements were done at five weeks after planting. 
It was right after that that we put on our side dress nitrogen. So technically, all those measurements were done before the crop had gotten its side dress application of nitrogen, okay? But it was, it was all essentially running off the early, the early uh, at planting nitrogen, okay? Um, so we did a number of different measurements, some estimates of maturity that I'd like to get into at some point in the future. Um, but what I'll talk about today is mainly the early season digger data, and then I want to talk a little bit about yield. So what we were hoping for is some interaction between nitrogen application rate and cultivar, okay? Um, if we look at the early season data, we have a significant effect, and, and don't get too hung up on all the numbers. I'm not expecting you to process all of these numbers all at once. But what I am trying to point out is in that early season, we didn't really have an effect of nitrogen rate um, for any of our growth parameters at either sample time. But what we did, and we didn't have any interaction, okay? But what we did have is we had a significant effect of cultivar on early season vigor. If we were to look at all these different growth parameters, I think you can consistently say that Stoneville 5020 was in the top in terms of early season growth, okay? Seedling, sorry, seedling bigger. If you'll recall, that is the largest seeded thing that we had from our set of uh, cultivars that we selected, okay? So it all agrees pretty closely there with what we assumed is that we have early season, you know, more vigorous early season growth. Now we didn't characterize root growth in the field. As you can imagine, it's pretty difficult to get good data on root growth in the field. I'll be talking about a controlled environment study that we did later. Um, but again, cultivar effects, and mainly we had the large seeded cultivar being the most vigorous. Uh, if we look at lint yield, we had a cultivar effect, and we had a nitrogen rate effect, but no cultivar by nitrogen rate interaction. So somewhat disappointing because it's not, we were hoping that we would see some interaction between cultivar and nitrogen, um, but that's research. So uh, if we look at these different cultivars, and remember, these yields are across all nitrogen levels. So if they look a little get low to you, they're across all nitrogen levels, okay? There, but still, I mean, there's nothing wrong with them, but if you look at our top yielding cultivars, we had 1646 at the top, and tied with it was Stoneville 5020. I don't know if you recall that, that slide with the different seed characteristics, but this one's our smallest seeded thing, and this one's our largest seeded thing, so it doesn't exactly match what we were talking about, does it? But remember, this one's the most vigorous early on, and this one just has, you know, has high yield potential. So it's not, it's not as simple as, all right, this one thing governs how we're gonna manage nitrogen necessarily, okay? Um, if we look at land yield again, yield response to nitrogen, so as nitrogen rate goes up, you see an increase in yield. None of this is terribly surprising. This yield environment, you know, uh, we're going to do this again next year, but the goal is to look at different environments, see if we get some of the higher end uh, yield environments as well because response to nitrogen can be influenced by environment as, as many of you know. Alright, now I'm not going to go into all of this. What I did want to say though is we took this a lot further. We looked at yield components. Okay, so where is all this yield coming from? If we look at, at uh, bowl density, if we look at uh, seed cotton weight per bowl, all of these things. Everything. And then the fiber quality parameters, all of this was affected by cultivar, all right? Uh, we had multiple parameters that were affected by nitrogen rate, and if you look at the intra-bowl stuff, so the components inside the bowl, lint weight per seed, fiber number per seed, fiber density, and when I say fiber density, I'm talking about the number of fibers on a certain unit seed surface area. Um, those, there was actually a significant cultivar by nitrogen rate interaction. So. Yield results didn't turn out exactly like we were expecting, but it could be related to some variation in yield components, which again, I haven't had time to really dig into, or it could be the fact that some of our varieties have just differences in early season vigor and can access uh, resources a little bit better, okay? So, 
as is typically the case, nothing's ever as straightforward as we might like it to be, okay? So before I move into the next project, and I should have kept my phone on me or something to figure out where I am on time, but before I move into the next project, any questions about that particular project? All right, I'll go on to the next project, and then uh, what I'm gonna do next is, and I'm, I wanna pause for just a little bit, the, this next one's called the Rain Exclusion Project. We were fortunate enough, we've been wanting to get some of these large rain out shelters for, uh, well, for a long time, but they're not exactly cheap. But we got, uh, we got support from the college, uh, the cotton team, the UGA cotton team got support from the college to put in three large uh, rain out shelters, okay? And this is what this, the reason this is important is it allows us to impose drought at the timings that we want, at the intensity that we want. If we want to assess for drought tolerance in different cultivars, we can do that, okay? Now, I'm gonna ask a question. If you had to pick a trait that lent itself to drought tolerance in cotton, what would that trait be? <clears throat> I'm, there's all kinds of things we could talk about, but if you had to pick a trait that would you think would make a plant more tolerant to drought, what would that be? Roots. Roots, um, roots, roots. Everybody's <coughs> talking about roots, okay? And I'm glad you did because it speeds my presentation up a little bit, okay? So absolutely, everyone's gonna talk about roots because you would expect that a plant that puts a lot of resources into the root system, grows an aggressive a root system, it's able to access more of the soil moisture that's available, right? Um, and so it would take a little longer for that plant to dry down, okay? So, roots, a well-developed root system. The reason I needed to ask you that is because the next slide is going to seem really different from what I'm talking about here, this rain-out shelter project, okay? So the next few slides are going to be different, but there's a reason for this. There, there was some work that was done years ago saying that cultivars that developed an, you know, an aggressively growing root system early on, and when I say early on, they were doing their work at like one, two weeks after planting, okay? Um, tended to be more tolerant to drought stress events during flowering, okay? Now all that work was done in the greenhouse, okay? Which is different, right? It's a different environment altogether. So, what we wanted to do was take those same cultivars you've seen in the nitrogen project and assess, start by assessing root growth and root characteristics, <coughs> and then from that, take those cultivars and expose them to drought stress during flower, okay? So this was a multi-layered project. Part of it was done in a controlled environment facility. The other part was done in the field using these rainout shelters. So I'm gonna start with the first part. We know that low temperature, and you'll, you'll wonder, okay, why is he talking about temperature? So I'll get, I'll get into that, okay? We know that temperature negatively impacts uh, growth. We know that cultivar can influence early season vigor, right? Now, if, yeah, I don't know how, much, how familiar you are with uh, seed vigor estimates, but typically there's some measure of germination under warm temperatures, optimal temperatures, okay? And then some measure of seed germination under cold temperatures, all right? And there's a type of test called the, well, it's like the warm-cold germ test. You combine those two germination, sets of germination data, okay? Now, what we did is we exposed plants to both what would be considered a day-night temperature treatment that's similar to the cold test and a day-night temperature treatment that's considered optimal for cotton, okay? And I'm gonna just kind of walk through the details of that experiment. Again, it's kind of weird that we've got all this cut off here, but um, it could be because I have the wrong layout, I don't know. Anyhow, um, we had two large chambers, two large chambers available to us. And we ran this three different times. So it's not like we just ran it one time. Here's a chamber, here's another. We randomized between the chambers every time. We had six cultivars. We had two temperature treatments. And we assessed uh, early seed. We assessed growth, both of the shoot. And then also I was fortunate enough to have a, a postdoc working in my lab that was really interested in root anatomy, okay? And what she did is she characterized root growth 
and then also took his smaller set of those cultivars and looked at the internal anatomy, and that'll be important here shortly, okay? Um, all these slides are showing is that temperature, right, this is optimal, this is low, temperature affects growth, no shocker. Um, again, optimal temperature, this is the root system after it's been washed off and put on a scanner for us to take an image. Um, and then, of course, this is the low temperature. That's not the point to this entire set of um, slides. The point is that there were significant cultivar differences in root growth, okay? And what, 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 what I thought was pretty cool is there weren't huge differences in shoot growth in the controlled environment, but when we looked at roots, and remember early on, where is the cotton plant putting most of its resources? It's putting most of its resources into that root system, okay? Um, if we look across both temperatures and look at the different varieties, and of course nobody can see my variety names here, but if we look at this, uh, what we see is, if you look at taproot length, we put a lot of emphasis on taproot length, there wasn't a lot of difference in taproot length here, okay? What there was a difference in was the number of secondary roots. So those are the roots that branch off of the main taproot, okay? There was a pretty substantial difference there. Um, and that agreed with a lot of other root characteristics, whether it's root surface area, that's the amount of root surface area that will be in contact with the soil, root volume, um, total, total root length, okay, that's if you could take all the roots and lay them end on end, um, that's total root length. But look at the secondary root number. At the top here is this Stoneville 5020, and it's tied with uh, another Stoneville variety, and let's see, next we have, we have a phytogen variety here. We have different varieties with our lowest number of secondary roots being 1646 and 1747. <coughs> they're, the, they're essentially the smallest seeded things we've got, okay? Now, the student took a subset of those and did some anatomy on it. Okay, did some anatomical work. Most cotton roots will have sort of this cross shape, and I'm, I'm sorry that it's not as clear as it could be, but they have essentially a cross shape arrangement of these, of the xylem, okay? The xylem is those, basically the tubes that run throughout the plant that move water to the rest of the plant, okay? Most of them have this sort of cross shape to it. Um, it's not that common to see ones that have more than four little arms sticking off of them, okay? But this one right here, D, again, it's, it's kind of interesting that 5020, one with the most secondary roots, had this hex arc pattern. So it had, had six arms coming off there. So a totally different arrangement, okay? The secondary roots come off of each one of those arms, so it makes sense that it had more secondary roots, okay? So what is the point to all of this? That we've got big differences in root characteristics between these cultivars, right? I think that's pretty straightforward. So then we took those and we exposed them to different drought stress treatments, okay? So these are the three large rain out shelters. This was all drip irrigated because it was the easiest way for us to conduct this experiment to impose different irrigation zones, all right? Uh, you can kind of see the water there. You can see the drip tape uh, in the middle of each bed, okay? Uh, but each one of these shelters is 30 by 93 or 96 feet long, or something like that. Uh, and then just to show you inside, what we had is we had a bed to the outside, and we would have an ex just to kind of serve as a buffer in case we got any rain that kind of came in from the side there. We had our experimental area, a bed that had multiple small plots scattered throughout. We had a buffer zone in between the next irrigation zone. Uh, and then we had our we had another experimental area followed by a buffer between there and the outside. Now you could just jam these shelters full of varieties, but then you'd end up being too close to the edges and and possibly getting water from the outside, and that's not what we want. Okay, um, this is just a sh just showing the experimental layout. It ended up being a little different than what was initially um, targeted, but the concept's still the same that we can have drought stress and well-watered plants in the exact same shelter. Now that's important. Those shelters, is the light coming through those shelters exactly the same as being outside of the shelters? No, it's not. So we can't have well-watered stuff outside of the shelter, right? Because it's an unfair comparison. So we had our well-watered and 
are drought stressed in the exact same shelters, okay? Um, apparently I moved forward on my slide here. This illustrates that we were able to impose, we had other, we had really good, and I, let me, let me kind of back up. The drought stress in this situation was where we imposed drought from first flower to three weeks after first flower, okay? Uh, and we used a soil moisture sensing approach. We worked with Dr. Belitis using uh, his watermark system, his smart sensor array system, and we used a threshold of 100 kilopascals um, soil water tension. So once that soil dried to that level, we would irrigate. And I think we went through three different irrigation cycles for our drought stress. So we didn't just shut the water off for three weeks. We targeted a specific level of stress, okay? So we didn't let it go to the extreme, but we were able to say this was the level of stress that the crop was under. At the end of the stress period, we did a lot of different physiological measurements. This is just showing the water status of the plant. So it's a little weird. The graphs are a little bit strange because we use negative values. So zero is the highest water potential that we can have. So it's strange, but it's kind of the rule for us. Um, that that's the highest water potential. So the more negative means you're more drought stressed, okay? Which is what this is showing. Even in the same, even just separated by one bed, a buffer, right? We were able to impose drought stress. And it rained all the time this year. We had some torrential downpours, and hey, we were able to keep water out. We were able to impose drought stress like we wanted to, okay? And that's the thing that we can get drought data um, even in years where we have excess rainfall. This is midday water potential essentially showing the same thing. If we look at lint yield, so we got about, I don't remember, this is between two, about two, 300 pounds to the acre difference. I think we got a 22% <coughs> decline in lint yield by imposing drought at that stage. And remember, this was a controlled drought. We weren't just letting it dry up the entire time, okay? So still a pretty substantial yield drop. This is different than anything else I've ever seen. Usually when I see a decline in yield under drought, typically see a decline in bowl number. It's almost always the thing that's limited. Um, but what we actually saw, and I didn't put the letters on here, but what we actually saw was that bowl mass is what declined. So apparently the plants retained roughly the same amount of bowls. Um, there was just less carbohydrate going to those bowls, so they were smaller, so the crop took a, a yield hit. Lint percent didn't really change. Um, and so we collected a tremendous amount of data. Look, there was no cultivar difference, no difference in tolerance to drought. So the roots are one part of the story, okay? I still think it's important, but if the plant is giving off water at the same rate from the leaf surfaces, it doesn't change anything, okay? So we have a lot of data on that as well. Haven't had a chance to process it all, but we have a tremendous amount of data on that as well. So any questions here? I have one last thing. I know, you know, y'all have to sit through that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, when you look at root mass, I know some of the varieties are in the paper list. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what would you use for insecticide-wise on those varieties? Okay. So for this, you're, you're right. So that is one thing we didn't really want to be a confounding factor. Um, yeah, the, one of them was truly root knot resistant, but even the 5020 and I know some the of the other. has got some root knot resistance, so mm -hmm. plenty to it, but. Yeah, yeah. So we use vellum total. We use the 18, we use the higher yeah. rate of vellum total. Okay. Good question. Anything else? Yeah. Dr. Snyder, do you think uh, temperature underneath those shelters affects? Yeah, so absolutely. So, we left the sides open on these things to allow airflow. So early in the season, it actually felt slightly cooler under the shelters than, than uh, you know, outside. Uh, once that canopy got up and covered to where there was no air movement inside, yeah, it got really hot under there, okay? Um, we can't, that's one of the things you just can't get away from uh, is yeah, it did get pretty hot under there. And, but that again, that is why we have to have the drought stress treatment and the well water treatment all under the same shelter because if we don't do that, then we are confounding our results. We don't know what's causing it. Is it because it was really hot under the shelter and not outside? 
Well, in this situation, we can just look at the drop trend, okay? Which is really helpful, all right? Um, again, I don't know where I am on time, <laughs> so as long as y'all are willing to continue asking questions, it's fine. But one other question that I'd like to kind of move on to the next thing. Or no other questions. That's fine. All right, let me go ahead and move on to the next. So this is a different situation. We did an uh, irrigation study in Camilla, Georgia. This is the second year of that study. Um, this is just the general experimental layout where we have these whole blocks here. We had, we actually had multiple varieties. We focused just on one variety for doing physiology measurements. Um, it was, uh, I think it's Stoneville 6182, but um, for, our, for our measurements. But we had multiple varieties in here. The bottom line is this was arranged within each block where our, our treatments were randomized within each block and then we would have another rep and then another rep, okay? So it was all randomized within that field and it was all blocked, okay? So um, we had the rain fed treatment, we had a so-called 100% treatment, that would be where we used the, the same evapotranspiration calculations that the irrigation scheduling app uses, the one that George just talked about. And then we had a 125% treat. So we were targeting 125% of evapotranspiration. That's basically over-irrigating, okay? Now the reason that's there is the previous year we were doing a remote sensing project looking at canopy temperature, and we wanted an over-irrigated uh, strip or over-irrigated plots to compare to. You kind of need that to calculate some versions of crop water stress index. So that's why that one is in there. But we went ahead and repeated this again this year. And what we wanted to know is what's driving these yield differences. So there's a lot of stuff you're not going to see today. Uh, we looked at radiation capture, light use, you know, radiation use efficiency, all of that stuff. But in the simplest terms, and again, I don't know that you can see it, but yield is basically biomass, so total dry matter per unit land area, times harvest index. Harvest <coughs> index is how that crop takes all that dry matter and partitions it to the part that we're going to yield, that we're going to use for yield, the part that the farmer is actually getting paid for, okay? And so what we did, and this is just, I think it's pretty interesting. So we wanted dry land, we wanted all these treatments. Well, you know, we got, what we got instead was a lot of rain, okay? And I want to just point out a few things here. Plant height, we got significant differences in plant height between our rain fed and our irrigated plots, okay? So this is, this is end of season, actually this is somewhere around cutout, plant height, okay? We had more measurements, but this just simplified it for the presentation. Um, all right, irrigated plots were a lot, plants were a lot taller, right? No surprise. It looks like our irrigation treatments are actually working. We're getting some level of drought stress, at least to cause a reduction in plant height. If we look at total biomass, there's less productivity, less total dry matter, sorry, I'm circling the wrong one, less total dry matter in the rain-fed plots than the irrigated plots, all right? The plants are performing a lot better, right? I mean, that's essentially what you would say here. So. 30% taller plants. It was interesting that it all came out to exactly 30% more biomass in the irrigated plants. However, when we look at yield, it's a different story. As we increased yield, as we increased the irrigation, we saw a yield penalty. All right, we saw the yield penalty. Now, as you can imagine, a plant that grows more, more aggressively. It will typically mature later, right? It takes longer for it to mature. And you can see this near the end of the season. These are already completely open. Yes. And these still haven't matured yet, okay? However, we didn't defoliate until the irrigated treatments were at least past 60% open bulb. All right? So we waited. We let this stuff sit here for an extra, I think it was about two weeks, somewhere in that neighborhood until we defoliated this, okay? So even with doing that, we took a yield hit. So the, the dry land was more productive. 
All right. All right, harvest index, just yield divided by total dry matter was a lot, you know, was substantially higher in the rain fed treatment than in the irrigated treatments. Um, so again, why? And, and I'll just tell you visually, well, these plants, they're about, you know, the, the rain fed plants are maybe waist high, but they were just loaded down with bowls. They retained bowls really well. Whereas the others, we had large plants and they had lower retention. You could visually see it, but if we look at correlation, you can see that the number of bolts per plant was positively associated with yield. Bottom line is, our so-called drought stress plants just retain more bolts, okay? So they had a higher harvest index and higher yield. So that's the bottom line. And I, that was my last topic. Um, questions? So would you speculate that reduced yield is because of uh, having I guess, the water that you're applying, or is it having some light and kind of smaller plants able to hold on to the Okay, so there's a few possibilities here, right? Um, if you have a smaller plant, more light can reach some of those lower. So for starters, I don't, how many, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but along a fruiting branch, you have a, a bowl and it's subtending leaf, the leaf that's right next to it. That leaf accounts for about 60% or more of the carbohydrate requirements for that bowl, okay? So if you've got an aggressively growing plant, it can actually shade those lower branches, okay? And reduce retention on those lower nodes, all right? But what I had always assumed, and I've seen that before, that's a pretty common thing. You get a lot of aggressive growth, you get lower retention at the lower nodes. But then typically the plant starts setting bowls higher up on the plant, and if you can wait for it to mature, you'll equal or maybe even exceed the yield, you know? So in this situation, that was not the case. This plant was just the drought, the so-called drought stress plants were just better at retaining bowls. Okay, so it could be associated with light in it, light getting through the canopy. Um, it could just be, that's just a, an environmental switch. Remember, biomass, they're, they're producing a lot of biomass. We could get that kind of biomass production and the kind of harvest index that we got in the rain fed. I mean, our yields would just be phenomenal because those yields weren't bad. There's nothing wrong with those yields, but you know, if you, yeah. Did you use a growth regulator on any of the irrigators? Yeah, used it, so I used a growth regulator on everything. Okay, so we had, I say I did. I asked the folks in Camilla to use a growth regulator on everything. So, but I would say that our first application, it was between squaring and first flower, but it was probably a little closer to first flower, okay? So that's one of the things that we're doing this year is looking at different PGR management strategies by irrigation treatment. And we're doing this specifically in Camilla because we typically get pretty rank growth down there. We get really good aggressive growth. Um, so I'm kind of curious if we can manipulate bowl retention at some of these higher levels. So we could get that kind of harvest index and a lot of biomass production. We should have some pretty phenomenal yields. Did y'all also evaluate the amount of bowl rot and hard lock on bowls that were present? We did not do that. No, we didn't. Um, we did some plant mapping, but just of the harvestable bowls. Okay. And that's true. I mean, the lower, there's no question that lower in the canopy, you did, we did see some of that in the, some of the taller plants. How much rainfall did you get on the dry land? Okay, so we got, and that's the one thing I want to point out, we got, if you just look at the numbers over the whole season, we got more than enough to max, I don't recall exactly the numbers, okay? But I would say that it's almost twice of what we say we need to reach a maximum yield. So, but, here, but here's the thing, so we're using an app that's based on environmental factors, okay? So we had hot, dry weather. Um, we also did water potential measurements where we went out and we cut leaves on these plants and we looked at water status. At no point during the season, if we were just looking at plant water status, would we have ever irrigated, okay? All that means, all that means is that we need to continue research in irrigation schedule, looking at approaches that account not just for environmental factors that affect water loss, but also uh, but also the level of plant stress. And so again, I've talked a little bit in the past about canopy temperature sensing and that type of thing as well. Yes. Uh, 
What was your, you said that 100 kilopascals was the dry land target for water. What was it on the year here? Oh, okay, it was 40. It was 40 because we've seen in the past where we got the same yields between that and the checkbook. What was the water holding capacity on the soil? Uh, that I don't have. I don't have that that data. Now, um, I don't recall if Alessandro collected soil samples that were then later analyzed, but again, I don't I don't exactly have that, okay? But if you're but the key with these is that if you're targeting a certain threshold, you're targeting a soil water potential, um, it takes out to some extent, it takes out the, the issues with okay, a clay has a different you know, has a different water hold or a plant available water than a sandy soil does, right? We know this, but the knowing that threshold, that just allows us to irrigate whenever we hit that threshold. And I think the application rate, I think we did uh, two thirds of an inch at each application using that drip system. I was just going to make the same comment. The current varieties that we're growing right now in the state, mm -hmm. uh, are the we did a lot of retention plant mapping this year. We did a lot of 2018. This year's crop we did not compare to 2018. We lost all of our cotton in South Georgia for Hurricane Michael in 2018. We were loaded from top to bottom. This year we had plants for the plant mapping and we had very few varieties regardless of plant date that were over 45% first of all retention, which okay. is pretty bad. And for some of the cotton to yield, I, I said all along, some of this cotton looks really good, but it's going to be disappointing. And it's, if you look at plant map, you may see if you have a plant that 13 or 14 bowls on it, you pull a plant in the same room touching it, they would have two bowls on it. All right. And some okay. of this cotton still weighs 14, 1500 pounds. Sure. Once we got past May 20, our yield started tapering off in South Georgia dramatically, you know, regardless of variety. For us, black flies, nematodes, and water were a big factor. Once you got past May 20th planting, May 20th, yeah, yeah. Once okay. we got past, and that's nearly about our optimum window. And that's one of the things I would say, whether you're talking about fix management, you're talking about irrigation. Um, I've always felt like, okay, so you've got a big plant, it's gonna retain a lower percentage of bowls, but it's gonna have more fruiting sites. So I worried a little less about it as long as we had a long enough season, right? So if you plant late, then you're gonna have a penalty for all that excess growth. Early, well this thing, this was planted, I think early to mid-May, so it was a little surprising. Well, yeah, if you look at triple five, everybody used to be, you know, that's the one that everybody, had on it was the highest yield of cotton product since we've had the state. If you look at where that variety made cotton, we currently have very few varieties that's capable of putting on five or six hundred pounds of cotton at the top. And if it's raining from August 15th to September 15th with varieties we're growing now, it's negative going to impact you. Yeah. Uh, I guess you can control your water here at that time, you can get much of the cotton. But, yeah. Well, and I, and I think that's the thing. That variety, what it did is it had delayed initial fruit set, so it may not set. It would set on the lower nodes, but not as at as high a rate. And then it was more broadly distributed over the pool, over that entire plant, so that total, yeah, it had more bowls. Yeah. Well, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, you know, you talk about square potential fruit retention, and everybody thinks cloudy weather, rainy weather for a long period of time you know, is the main culprit of cavitation or, you know, shit fruit shed, but Maricot's doing studies, this will be the second year, on heat tolerance. So once you get up above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, your pollination starts to decrease. So how many days did you have of 100 degree temperature? We were 17 days over. Well, that's what I'm saying, though. So, you know, we were 17 days. People look at cloudy, wet conditions and, you know. Uh, 17 days of heat you know, as it sheds fruit because of that, but high temperatures also do that as well. Yeah, so what I, one of the things I worked on, something I still have an interest in here, um, is high temperature stress on reproductive development cotton. That's what I did my dissertation on, so that's all we worked on. But there are certain thresholds once you get above a certain temperature, and not just that temperature, but for a certain period of time, right? right. And the timing is real critical as well, okay? Um, one of the, I do have a I'd love to talk more about heat stress physiology because I actually have a real interest in that, but this was most of what I was doing this past season were these projects. And I think this season, early season, high temperatures were, were I mean, I saw some pretty extreme stuff, 
And so the other graduate student, so I've got a few graduate students sitting back there, but uh, Preet back there, she's going to be looking at, of course we're working with our cotton breeders, so it's, it's all conventional stuff, you know, but we're looking at uh, response to extremes in temperature, okay? So that is something that we're looking at in the seedling stage, but we definitely need to look at it. We need to look at it in the flowering stage. The problem is how do you impose heat stress in the flowering stage without being a controlled environment study? And then they don't grow the same in those pots in the chamber as they do out in the field. That's always been one of the limitations. The question I have for all of you is what time is it? <laughs> ah, okay, okay, so I'm, I'm over my time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.